open book. This is an open book uh, test here. Tell me some of the things that, that has happened in the first uh, two chapters. Well, we got the birth of Christ. Okay. Birth of Christ. Yep. And he grew. And he grew. Okay. <laughs> All right. Jesus is teaching in the temple. Jesus is in the temple. Great. Very good. We also have John the Baptist story. John the Baptist, right. Who now how how is John the Baptist related to Jesus? <clears throat> cousins. They were cousins, right? Anybody else? That's the best you got today. <laughs> well, that's that's a pretty good start. That's a pretty good start. So uh, one and two, Luke records the birth narratives of John the Baptist and Jesus. And as we get to chapter three, uh, how many years have passed? Do you know how many years have passed between chapters two and chapters three? 18. Yes, 18. Ding, ding. You win the prize. 18 years have passed uh, from the time that Jesus was in the temple. So now um, um, Jesus and John are about the same age, right? So that would put them at how old? 30 years old. Yep. So for 30 years, Jesus and John has lived in pretty much seclusion. The Bible tells us that Jesus went to what city to live in? Nazareth. And he went with his parents. And I think it's in maybe 251. It says that he was there in subjection to his parents. So he was growing and and learning and everything like that up until age 30. Where was John? In the wilderness. John was in the wilderness, wasn't he? Okay. Something interesting about, about John, and of course this is somewhat speculation, but John was um, the son of Zacharias, right? And what, who, what was Zacharias? He did the temple, the temple. Leader. He was a priest. Okay, so John uh, was in that lineage. He was in that line. So he was to be in the quote family business. He was to be also a priest. Okay, but at some time, um, there's some players here, and I don't know whether I should bring this up now, but I will bring it up now. There's some players here that um, were the really only people that knew about about Jesus and about John. Who were they? Elizabeth. <laughs> Elizabeth, okay, that's one. Who else? Mary. Mary. <coughs> we're getting closer. Yeah. yeah. And and who else? Joseph. Joseph. And Zacharias. Zacharias. And Anna, Anna, Simeon. and Simeon. Simeon, right? And these folks <laughs> we just talked about here—they're um, older, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Or not? Maybe they're not even around anymore. Right, and that's the point. That probably at some point in John's life, his dad passed, his mom passed, uh, and, a, and a lot of these people—they um, went on to glory, right. didn't they? Okay, so you have John, and what's interesting about um, if you're in that, if you're in that, um, what do I want to say? If you're in the 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 priestly line, it was at the age of twenty that you actually began to become involved in the temple and start to do priestly duties. Okay, now some people feel that that's the time where John did not do that, and he went off into the wilderness. Other people feel that he went off to the wilderness even earlier than that. But anyway, so we find Jesus. He's in seclusion in Nazareth. We find John. He's off in the desert somewhere. Okay. And so for, for 18 years, you think about this. For 18 years, what had been talked about was silent. Nothing happened for 18 years. And how I'm just trying to think about us. How do, 18 years would be a long time, wouldn't it? I mean, you get the promise of uh, the Messiah, you get the promise of uh, the, 
the boy's crying in the wilderness and nothing happens for 18 years. That, that seems to be a long time. You so you got the inner, inner, inner testimony period where there's 400 years of yes, silence. Right. You know, so that's even. Yeah. So we have basically 30 years. Okay. And we also have 400, 400 years. Uh, and Malachi was the last uh, book. And he talked about um, the Messiah. He talked about the, the coming. Um, about That was about 430 B.C., but silence for 400 years, no. silence for 30 years, okay? So now, Jesus is 30, John's 30, okay? And where is, let me just see here, I should be here. Let's read this here. Okay, where is Jesus? <laughs> that's okay he's going to fix and i'm going to read luke let's turn to luke chapter three and begin with verse one we'll read through um verse six now in the 15th year of the reign of tiberius caesar when pontius pilate was governor of judea and herod was tetrarch of galilee and his brother philip was tetrarch of the region of ituria and trachonitis and licinius was the tetrarch of abilene in the high priest of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of the Lord came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came into all the district around Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every ravine will be filled, and every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked will become straight. And the rough road smooth, and all flesh will see the salvation of God. Okay, so as we might say, the curtain is arising here uh, for Jesus and John the Baptist. We find that Israel was, as far as historically, let me just see what happens here. But was historically in a very bleak and dark place. Okay. Politically, how were they politically? Who was ruling over them? Gentile. Romans. The Romans, okay. Gentiles, uh, as far as the, the Jews are concerned, dogs, idolaters, you know, those kinds of things. They were being, uh, they were being controlled. They were being heavily taxed. They could barely survive. <laughs> And that was kind of the state in which in which they were in. Um, they were, and like I like this one commentator says, they were crushed under the heavy burden of Rome. But not only were they crushed under the heavy burden of Rome, but religiously they were crushed under the the rule of the religious leaders of that day which were apostate, which were, I'm trying to think of some other words here, um, they were crushed um, apostate, legalistically, and hypocritically by a corrupt, wicked, spiritual leadership, okay? So politically, they were in a very difficult place, and spiritually, they were in a very difficult place also because of the, the legalism that the, the leaders, the Sadducees and the Pharisees had uh, uh, brought upon them. Uh, Israel had not realized the promise of the Abraham covenant and of the Davidic covenant. Now, Abraham covenant has to do with uh, land, okay? So the land wasn't theirs, it was whose? It was the Romans, wasn't it? Right. And they had not yet seen the spiritual blessing of David uh, as far as being the kingdom. So they were in a, a very, very bleak, um, tough place. The Old Testament, we talked about out of Malachi there in, uh, in Malachi 3. Would someone read that? Would someone turn to Malachi 3? If you'd read verse one, anybody. 
Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Right. And that was the hope, wasn't it? That was what they were longing for, but it took 400 years, didn't it, to get to the point where we're at right now. So we have John the Baptist. He is prophesied by his father, who said, and you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways. Okay? So John's task is twofold. Number one is to prepare the people for the Messiah, and it's also to present the Messiah to the people, and that was his, his task. So here we come upon this chapter three. Luke, who was a physician, you'll notice that as you look at the Gospels, Luke uh, is a little more um, detailed than maybe the other ones, and you might expect out of a doctor that there'd be some more details, maybe a little more specificity in that. And so he begins here to give us a historical setting as far as um, what's going on right now. And, and he does that for a purpose, okay? He's very concerned about not just Jesus the Messiah or not just Jesus the Savior, but he's very concerned about the historical Jesus, Jesus in time and space, Jesus in the midst of history, okay? How many of you know that history is important, okay? Isn't it? And how many of you kind of feel like maybe some things today that the people's trying to rewrite history it's a little bit? I think of things like the 1619 Project, and I'm sure you can come up with some other things, but people are trying to rewrite history, and history is, is very, very, very important. And so I something very prophetical here that he's thinking about, you know, we wanna, we got to make sure that Jesus is locked into time and space here, and that he is part of history, and we can look back on that, okay? So here we go. Luke in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of, I'm sorry, governor of um, Judea, and Herod was the tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip was tetrarch of the region of Iturea, and Trachonitis, and Licinius was the tetrarch of Abilene, in the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. So Luke gives us seven different people, okay, in this very little short introduction here in chapter three. Five are Gentiles and two are Jews. And they're going to provide the background for a lot of what John and Jesus goes through. In fact, in particular, there's four, isn't there? There's, there's Herod, Tet, or there's Herod uh, uh, Antipas, there is um, uh, Caiaphas, there's Ananias, and Pontius Pilate. And they're going to play a, a big role in the lives of John and, and Jesus. So the first guy that we're going to look at is Tiberius Caesar, okay? Tiberius, uh, Claudius Caesar, Augustus, probably known simply as Tiberius was the Roman emperor at the time of the crucifixion of Christ. Tiberius reigned for 23 years from 14 to 37 AD. When the first Roman emperor, Augustus, Caesar Augustus, he was the emperor at the time of the birth of Christ, died on August 19, 14 AD. He was succeeded by his stepson Tiberius, the son of Livia Drusilia. Okay, so Claudius Caesar here uh, is the second Roman emperor. Okay, Caesar Augustus was the first. Tiberius was the second Roman emperor from 14 to 37, adopted son of the Roman emperor Caesar Augustus. Okay, so adopted son, never aspired to follow his father's footsteps. The path was chosen by his domineering mother Livia. His 23-year reign as emperor would seem estranged from his controlling mother and living in self-imposed exile from the duties of running an empire, okay? So the one thing I just want to point out here about uh, this particular man and the dating of this, um, it's interesting. There's, there's two, two thoughts here because Luke says in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, okay? There's two schools of thoughts as, as far as this goes. Um, Caesar Augustus, who was the first Roman emperor, the guy before him, dies on August 19th in uh, AD 14. 
Okay, if we took it just right from when he actually became um, the sole emperor, that would mean that John's ministry began in 29. <clears throat> now, there's a more traditional view that he didn't actually become emperor when Augustus died, but three years prior to that, he became what they call a co-regent, a co-emperor with him. And so the dating seems to be a little bit stronger from him being co-regent than just from when Augustus died. Um, basically, a couple of the reasons here. Uh, the reference of the co-regency, if we're, you're going to see in just a little bit, Annas and Caiaphas also had a co-regency going on, and, and some people, scholars think that Luke um, picked up on that and brought it into Annas and Caiaphas. Second, uh, first century Jewish historian Josephus uh, talks about the building of the temple, and so um, the Jewish leader said to Jesus uh, in John 2.20, 2, that uh, the temple had been under construction for 46 years. And that would make the date of the Passover that year of 27, which in turn places the start of Jesus's ministry in late 26. That would make Jesus about 30 years old when he began his uh, ministry. And that backs up from what Luke said in 323 about he was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. So um, co-regency for about three years. And that's the date that we're going to run uh, from when uh, Luke is talking here about him being, being the emperor. So if we move along, uh, this, this right here, this kind of education, all the colored stuff here, this is all the Roman em Empire. I mean, it covered a lot of ground, didn't it? I mean, and there were some things outside of that that we're going to call unoccupied territory, uh, which probably in years to come, they probably took over that too, or parts of that. But for right now, um, what we're looking at in Luke 3, we're looking at the Romans controlling just about everything in that, in that time period. <clears throat> Next guy we want to look at here is Pontius Pilate. He was the fifth governor. Now, it says here six, but that's not true. He was the fifth governor. I, I wholeheartedly disagree. Uh, Pontius Pilate was the fifth governor, a uh, Roman procurator or governor of Judea from about 26 to 36 AD. His administrative center was in Caesarea, and that would be Caesarea, I think, Philippi. His governorship was contemporary with the ministry of John the Baptist and then of Christ. He is best known as the judge of Jesus' trial and the man who authorized uh, the crucifixion of Christ. So this is one of those guys of the four that is going to have a, a lot to do with the life of Jesus and, and John. Now, I want to show you this. The Roman Empire, again, is big. But you see this little thing right here? There's this little place right down here. Right there. Can you guys see that? Judea. Okay. So Tiberius is over everything. Okay. And right down here in Judea, that's Pontius Pilate. He gets just a little piece of the pie, doesn't he? Just a little, little bit. Pontius Pilate, fifth governor of the Roman province of Judea. Serving under Emperor Tiberius from 26 to 27 to 36, 37 AD, best known for being the official who presided over the trial of Jesus and ultimately ordered his crucifixion. Pilate's importance in modern Christianity is underscored by his prominent place in both the Apostle and the Nicene Creed. Um, due to the Gospels portrayal of Pilate as a reluctant to execute the Ethiopian church beliefs that Pilate became a Christian and venerates him as both a martyr and saint. I believe was a historical group um, shared by the Coptic Church. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's kind of it's kind of a stretch there. Um, when when Pilate was made uh, governor there by Tiberius, one of the first thing he did is that he began to march his troops in, uh, bearing uh, idols and false images, false gods, and it it just blew the uh, the Jews' mind, and they they rebelled. And um, he said, if you don't um, stop your rebellion, I'm going to slaughter you all. Well, they called his bluff, and he ended up having to remove all of the things that he had brought in. And, uh, and that began a real uh, difficult time between uh, Pilate and the Jews. They, he basically detested and hated the Jews. And so because of them calling his bluff, he felt somewhat emasculated and just 
began a tirade against them. He just did not like them uh, at all. Very brutal guy, as was Tiberius. Uh, some people say of Tiberius that he was inhuman or inhumane. Um, he was so bad, uh, brutal in his in his uh, the way that he oversaw his country. Back, back, <laughs> we could say a lot of things about these guys, um, but it would probably uh, make your uh, toes curl and you wouldn't want to hear the things that they did and that they were known for because they were very, very, uh, very, very bad, bad people. So Roman governor was an official either elected or appointed to be the chief administrator of the Roman law throughout one or more of the provinces constituting the Roman Empire. Roman governor is also known as a pro praetor or pro council. So when you see some of those words like that, it means the same thing. Governors were either consuls or, or praetors, and they were called proconsuls or propraetors when their power was extended for more than one year. So if you, you were in that position for more than one year, you kind of got a little designation here as to, to what you send it decide which province to be governed by proconsuls and which by praetors. The praetors and consuls would then draw lots to determine the particular province. Now you see that word tetrarch. I was wondering, what's a tetrarch? That's a big big word. Well, originating in 5th century Greece, the title used away as Thessaly in Galatia, although Greek tetrarchy's original meant ruler of fourth, and that's basically what that actually means. It's a ruler of fourth, ruler of a fourth part of a province, tribe, or country. By Roman times, it became a favorite designation for the provincial rulers in Palestine. Tetrarch referred to emperor-appointed vassals who retained local sovereignty but whose income was fixed and had no autonomy concerning foreign affairs. That was used in three New Testament figures, ancient costs, um, called Herod, Philip, and then Lysimus of Abilene. So just to show you here, now this would be, uh, some of this is repeating to right now, some of it's not. Philip, he was the Tetrarch from 4, to 4 BC to 34 AD. He had this little spot up here. Philip was, if you do a little research on Philip, he was probably the best of all the guys that we were talking about here. Uh, he, he was very, I wouldn't say he was a kind guy, but he was much <coughs> better than, than the other guys that we talk about, and much more just. Herod Antipas, um, he has those areas. And then Archelaus, okay, uh, who was... Uh, in Matthew 2, 22, remember when uh, Mary and Joseph heard that Archelaus reigned in Judea? Uh, they were afraid to go there, and they went a different way. That was him. Archelaus was actually uh, deposed by the Roman government. All right, I'll get this. You're going to laugh about this because of his cruelty. Now, if any group of people had uh, a lock on cruelty, it was the Roman government. So... They got rid of this guy because he was cruel and cruel. He was he was very very cruel. So we see here a little bit different picture here. Territory under Archelaus, territory of Antipas, territory of Philip, which is up there, and then here Jamnia under Salome, which is Herod's sister. She had this right there. Do you remember who Salome was? In the Bible, we'll get we'll get to her a little bit a little bit later. So we'll pass on that. So here's a little bit of historical con context, a um, little bit about Caesar, <laughs> and these are the guys that uh, are affecting Jesus, or at least are in this game right now uh, at uh, Luke three. Uh, Pontius Pilate, Herod, who would be here at Antipas, Philip. Uh, uh, at Licinius, and then uh, the high priest uh, Annas and Caius. Antipas, second son of Herod, uh, not a good guy at all. If you remember John and what happened to John, right? It was because of this guy, because John kept after him because of his relationship with his brother half brother's wife some people believe that that this half brother was was living in rome other believes that it's philip 
that we talked about here, the, the other tetrarch. Uh, not sure about that. Uh, but anyway, he took he, the story is he he went to Rome, he seduced his half brother's wife, okay, which would have been his half sister, right? Okay, yeah, it gets it gets kind of kind of crazy, but this this didn't go well with John the Baptist, and in response, uh, Antipas had uh, John beheaded. So that's that's the bad guy. Just at that time, this is a neat little thing here. Some Pharisees approached saying to him, Go away, leave here, for Herod wants to kill you. That would be uh, Antipas. He said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today, and tomorrow, on the third day, I reach my goal. Nevertheless, I must journey on today and tomorrow and the next day, for it cannot be that prophet would perish outside of Jerusalem. So Jesus is just kind of telling them, Look, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I'm not worried about him. He has nothing on me. Just tell him to, you know, go away. So that was Jesus' kind of response to that. There's Philip, sometimes called Herod Philip II. Okay. Um, he was the son of Herod the Great. Uh, his fifth wife, Cleopatra of Jerusalem. He was a half brother of Antipas. And this is the possible uh, guy that Antipas stole his wife from. from. Not sure, but maybe. Uh, it should not be confused with Philip II, uh, which some writers call Karen Philip. Make sure I didn't miss anything here. Okay. Licinius, the guy that has that little small place, okay, little, little area called Abilene. Uh, Licinius was the ruler of the small realm on the western slopes of Mount Hermon, attested to by the Jewish writer Josephus and in the coins by Circle 40 C. There's also a mention of Licinius dated to 29 AD in the Gospel of Luke. It depends on the whether these are the same person. Um, this particular guy here, um, the way that Luke portrays him, uh, brought a lot of, um, I'm going to say, a lot of uh, looking at Luke as far as actually being um, a good source because of the confusion between the two. But later times have passed, and there was two Licinius's. And not just the one. So this is Licinius's little property here, right here. So he didn't have much, but he's still in the picture. Now we come to these two guys, okay? Annas and um, Caiaphas, okay? So we go from the political realm now, and we're going to hop into the spiritual realm. Okay, now this is a little tricky here with, with Annas and Caiaphas. Okay, um, Annas became high priest but was removed from office by the Roman procurator for imposing and executing capital sentences which had been forbidden by the imperial government. Mm -hmm. I don't know, they didn't go into detail, that's all they said. Um, after a few interim high priests, Caiaphas became high priest. Since Annas hadn't died, he was technically still high priest according to the law, but Caiaphas had become high priest as well. So you got a little struggle going on here. The Romans, um, they had something to do with appointing the high priest. And basically it had to do with money. Okay, so if you paid enough money, you could be the high priest. Okay, so anyways, Annas, who was the high priest, did something that the Romans didn't like. So they, they depose him. They, they take him out. Well, under Jewish law, a high priest is high priest for life. I mean, that's just, just the way it was. So you've got, you've got this struggle going on, okay? And Caiaphas, who was um, Annas' uh, son-in-law, um, well, Caiaphas actually had five other sons and a son-in-law, and they all had some part to play in, in the high priest as time went on. But Caiaphas uh, became the high priest. So Annas, because he was still alive in the mind of the, the Jewish people, he was still the high priest. But in the minds of the Romans, uh, he was not the high priest. A little more detail there. Five sons who became priests brought in law to Caiaphas, who was the current high priest. Uh, first to interview Jesus after his arrest. 
Caiaphas, current high priest, son in law to Amos, condemned Jesus with him. So they both, but they actually brought Jesus to Amos first because they thought he was really the high, the high priest. Oops, sorry. Mean looking guy, isn't he? <laughs> At least one daughter who was married to Caiaphas, five sons, dynasties, five sons also became high priests. Uh, elsewhere in the Bible, there talk about John the Baptist, of course, involved with Jesus. High priest in Jesus' state was Caiaphas. Um, 15th year, that doesn't mention the connection with uh, John's death. Interesting here, in John 11, here, there is a, a little blurb here that uh, um, Caiaphas says, that, but one of them, Caiaphas, who was a high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing, nor do you consider that it's clear to you that one man should die. He said of the people, so that the whole nation may not perish. He did not say this on his own, but since he was high priest, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. Amazing, here you got this guy, that he's not going to And he's prophesying uh, that Jesus is going to die uh, for the nation. Uh, Annas, proud, ambitious, greedy man, a uh, major source of his income as high priest came from the temple. He the high priest basically owned the area where you bought your sacrifices. You bought the doves, you bought the lambs, you bought the goats, you bought all of these things. He was the one that set the price. And it's, and it's bizarre. Yes, and it's bizarre. They, they refer to it as Anna's bizarre. And so um, not only did he have that, but he also was in charge of the money changers. So when the people came in, they had to exchange their money to buy the stuff, and he set the rate. So he was a thief. I mean, <laughs> this guy, this guy, he had it going there. I'll tell you, he really did. He had it going. Um, but it was a major, um, major, major source of income for the high priest. And that's why they really hated Jesus, because he came into the temple, what, twice and disrupted their business. And they, they couldn't have that. They couldn't have that at all. So two wretched individuals, greedy, corrupt, uh, pagans, uh, exercising tremendous control um, over, the, uh, over the people. Uh, so it was, it was into this world that we talk about these seven guys that John and Jesus are coming into now. Okay, so. So. Geographical setting. We're going to be looking at, at four different settings. We're going to look at the historical setting, which we just saw, the geographical setting. We're going to look at a prophetical setting. And I'm not sure what the other one was, but I'll tell you in a minute. Um, so the geographical set here. John the Baptist, uh, an itinerant preacher and a major religious figure mentioned in the canonical Gospels and Quran. He's described in the Gospels of Luke as a relative of Jesus who led a movement of baptism at the Jordan River. So remember, John's out in the desert, okay? We're not really sure how, how far he's out in the desert or, or how long he had been uh, in the desert, but he's in the desert. And this is the desert or the wilderness of Judea where he was actually at. What do you think? Well, geez, you know, wilderness, you know, woods kind of place, kind of cool. I mean, 30 years out there, or maybe 10, or whatever you whatever it turned out to be. Um, how bad? How bad could that be? Well, that's the wilderness. <laughs> okay. That's the that is the Judean wilderness. And that is where John was at. Now, do you remember what kind of clothes did John have? Camel, camel hair. Camel and hair a belt. and a bell. And what did he eat? He, he ate locusts. You know, I, I can tell you a lot of things about, we can tell a lot of things about John the Baptist, particularly one thing, he was probably not overweight. <laughs> okay. Uh, locusts and honey, right? That's all he ate. I mean, get up in the morning, let's have some uh, locust pancakes and with a little honey and go to lunch. Let's have some Fried locusts. Go for dinner. Let's have some marinated. I mean, locusts and honey. Locusts and honey for years and years and years. Um, 
tough life. Tough life. Um, John has also been kind of thought about that he may have been with um, one or two other groups in the desert, the Essenes. Have you ever heard of the Essenes? There was a group of kind of nomadic people called the Essenes. There was also the Qumran community. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard of the Qumran community, but um, some people say he did, and other people say, no, he didn't have anything to do with, with either one of um, those churches. But possibly. Barry Beitzel from Moody says it is difficult to describe adequately the foreboding desolation and howling barrenness along the shores of the Dead Sea. If there could be fixed in one mind, in one's mind, the image of the almost painful sterility of the Sahara of Death Valley, and then multiply that by a factor of four or more, one might come close to capturing the geographical reality to which he is exposed along the shores of the Dead Sea. So, not a nice place, you know, not a good place, okay? And so, now think about us, okay? Here's, here's John, and he is, you know, he's led to go out into the desert for years, okay? And be in this situation, uh, John is wearing camel garb and a belt. He's eating locusts and honey. He's not the kind of guy that you want to invite over to your house. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? He's just not, okay? But is he content? He's content, isn't he? He, he believes that he's, he is there. How about us? And God said, Tom, I'd like to send you into the desert for 10 years and you're going to eat locusts and honey. He won't be content. He won't be content. <laughs> How are you doing with that? Okay. But for whatever reason, this guy, um, he is out there and he's being what? Faithful. Patient. Because something that God is going to do. It says the word of the Lord came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness, and he went into all the region around the Jordan. That particular word, that the word came to him, is the word Rama. Okay, it's not the word Logos, so it's not like he got it out of the Bible or out of the Old Testament somewhere. That somehow a <laughs> word came to him. All right, that he was supposed to now begin to preach okay if you look up jeremiah ezekiel Hosea, joel jonah micah zephaniah haggai it's that same word that came to them the same word and the word of the lord came to jeremiah and the word of the lord came to ezekiel and the word of the lord came to hosea okay so john's in good company okay John is not a New Testament preacher. John is the last Old Testament what? Pre uh, prophet. 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 He is the last Old Testament prophet, and he falls right in with these guys. Okay? At this time, a message from God came to John, son of Zechariah, who's living in the wilderness. Preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. So there's John the Baptist. He's out there in the Jordan baptizing people for the remission of sin. Yeah. Okay. Oh no, is it a hard one? <laughs> Maybe I don't know. Oh no. Baptism. Yes. I mean, it's not spoken of a whole lot. Um, where did he, where did people understand the need for okay. baptism? Good question. And I have a good answer. Oh, good. Okay. This was not so, set up. <laughs> no, this is not set up at all. Just okay. So in the Old Testament, all right, as far as the Jews were concerned, 
there was no baptism. All right. They had ceremonial washings and things like that. But now here's where it gets a little dicey. The only baptisms in the Old Testament were when Gentiles wanted to come into the Jewish faith. Okay. So they had to get circumcised. Ow. They had to get baptized. Okay. And the reason that they had to get baptized. Okay, because they were so dirty, they were so pagan, they were so, you know, Gentiles, they were so dogs, that they were so dirty, that they had to get washed. Okay. And this is what John is saying to the Jewish people. You're dirty, you're dogs, you're filthy, you need to get washed. And that was... That was like, for a Jew to hear that, they're losing their, their mind. You know, we are Abraham's children. Why, why, why do we have to? But he was telling them that filthy rags, you know, your things are like filthy rags, okay? You're no better than the Gentiles, okay? That was a very difficult thing for, for, for them to, to understand, um, there's three important, boy, I don't, I don't want to do that to extent. Let's pause for some questions. Maybe we can take this next time up for some questions. I didn't want to jump into here yet. But. Any questions or comments? And then the baptism of Jesus, that was what the baptism into God's will or God's purpose, because he was spotlessly plain. So and we'll, we'll talk about that next week. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You should spend more time. Yeah. But uh, no, you're correct. This baptism here of John is just, uh, like I said, let me go back here, just a couple of things here. We can do it. It was, a, it was preaching, it was a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin, which is different than Jesus's baptism, you know, like we're baptized, okay, uh, we're baptized for salvation, okay, this is like repentance for the forgiveness of sins, and there's a couple of things that we're going to talk about next week, the three, three theological things that we're going to talk about that have to do with uh, John and, and uh, what did you say? Three, can, can I say something? Three, or, yeah. Uh, you just said something that made me think, you know, we're, we're baptized not because of we want to get saved, but we're baptized because we want to be a testimony of our salvation. Mm -hmm. yeah. But right. Yeah. yeah when you to, said that, it sounded like it was right. We want to follow the Lord in obedience yeah. to, to being baptized. You know. And of course, there are folks out there that have a little different twist on that. They believe that you have to be baptized right. in order to be saved. Church of Christ. Yeah, we don't. You know, hear to that or see that, but um, really <clears throat> anything else? Any other questions about yeah, John? Yeah, I was reading in the commentary talking about repentance through what John was doing. And repentance has two sides, and we need to remember this. I need to remember this. Everyone needs to remember this. Yeah. <laughs> Turning away from sin and turning toward God. Oh, yes. Uh, it is to, to be truly repentant, you must do both. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you can't say you're turning away from sin and then continue to live how you were living. Right. You know, so that's, that's, uh, I thought that was pretty important to to think about it well on. right and in fact as, as you go a little bit further i think we're up through um verse six but as you go on there and, and as john is baptizing uh, people they're not really understanding right you know exactly. what this is that's yeah that's yeah and he, he is explaining it to them and and it actually it comes down to the very practical things like the, the tax 
collector says, what shall I do? Well, don't stop being a tax collector. He doesn't say that. Right. He says, but, but be fair. Right. You know, and um, the, the Roman soldier comes up and says, well, what shall we do? Well, he says, don't stop being a soldier. He says, but don't intimidate people. Right. You know, be, be, don't, don't be that guy. Yeah, don't stop being a businessman, just being honest. Business. Be an honest businessman, right. So you're right. There is a, there is a thing there where it's like, okay, you're going to get baptized, but there's, there's got to be something that changes in your life, you know, that gives the fruit of your baptism. Exactly. It be a transformation. A right. tra your transformation. Yeah. Yeah. And then we'll find out next week. I like it. You know, John, he comes in, he sees, he sees some of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming and he just lets them have it. Oh, you brood of vipers, you blah, 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 blah. You know, John, tough, mean, manly John, you know, and, and it's like, well, we, where's Jesus at? You know, and everybody thinks, well, Jesus is so weak and mild. Or if you go a little bit further in Luke, we find out he says the exact same things and even harder than what, than what John said, you know, so, yeah, pretty good. Anything else? Anybody else? Or you're going to get out in a minute early. <laughs> that's, that's all I got right now. Oh. There it is. Yeah, very good. I did it.